Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the introduction to Moth Trapping Talk. Uh, not to give anything away about today's talk, so we'll get right into introductions. Uh, we've got Mike Hill, uh, who is the conservation uh, ranger for Centre Parks in Sheffield uh, and Holiday Village. He has a keen interest in birds and moths. Uh, also, regularly trapped moth traps at home as well as all over the country and further afield during his holiday time. Uh, and then we also have Tom Shields. Uh, who is a keen naturalist around the south of Nottinghamshire and also has a keen interest in bird and moths as well. Uh, if you ever want to catch Tom in the wild, uh, if you head yourself down to Colic Park, you'll often find him there, birding away throughout the day. Yeah, and that's that. I hope everyone enjoys the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, in the morning. Um, so, this is the second time I've done this presentation. So, the last time was never uh, practice was, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, so it might have been some of this time. Um, so, yeah, so actually, um, this is hopefully totally a very basic introduction to moth trapping. So obviously we can't go into every species, you know, two and a half thousand or more than in the UK. So it's really just to give you an idea of, if you were thinking about doing some moth trapping, what you would do, what you need, um, where you could go, and what you might see, basically. That's what we're going to try and do for So. Um, so we're going to do two things, why you use a trap, the different types of moth trap that uh, are available out there, other methods that you can use to go surveying for moths and looking for moths. Um, and we'll go through some species for you, some, some of the highlights and the unique things you might see or some small things. Um, and at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions. Okay. So, why use a trap? Most of them come to light. Okay. Um, so having the outside light on this and all that will attract moths, but if you've got a purpose they'll just pop it up with a, a light that is going to attract them, it's a great way of doing it. So it's a good thing for that light. Uh, it's a safe and secure method for the moths. You're not going around and trying to catch them in the net, but they're coming in and they're over the cold, they're the day, you know, some bumps, some money. And I'm going to inside that trap. Safety places, although I have seen photos of, of bats inside moth traps. Cogs. Uh, random birds. House friends. Martin. What's that? I've seen a house Martin in one, I think. A house Martin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen that. But they don't think they realise that there's a point in the book right here. But on the whole, they are safe. You can get to know them a little more. Uh, can be done very cheaply, <laughs> as we'll, we'll show you. Can I pick it up? 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 Can I pick on the balcony, you know. Um, but yeah, if you want to, I'd you know, go take the trap on holiday with me as it's gone. But we also go around the county at various sites and uh, traffic. So they, they are easily transportable. But the thing is, you do need an hour source for that line. So that could be a generator, could be a car battery, whatever. There's various things you can do. We tend to uh, stick with the generator to it's more reliable and the amount of longer than the last. Well, that's a relic at the types of moth trap that are out there on the market. And the first one, this is a Robinson trap. Um, this is at the top end of the, uh, this is the Rolls Royce of the, of the moth, moth trapping. So, ex well, it's very expensive, it's quite expensive, but around about £3.50 uh, pounds, so £300. Pounds. Uh, basically, a big tub for the first time it's clear of the cover, and it's not. We put it on there with flames in it, put a um, weather dial on top, the rain dial on top, to keep the rain off of the pool, but basically you have that with the bomb. The moths are going to be attracted to it, they'll spiral down and get close to the veins, the dock in the bottom. Really good at holding onto the catch, so you can do that on an outdoor night, which is the one I use, that's why I use a word. Uh, we'll do this out on the night uh, and go back first in the morning to empty it. Uh, you'll notice that's, that ball is there. Called a mercury vapor ball, but then being ball is a 125 watt one, it's a very powerful, very bright, and it's emitted light at a certain uh, frequency that will attract the moths in. Uh, to go with that, if you have that kind of ball, you do need that little box in the corner, which is a good choking unit, and I'm not sure exactly what it does. It's a magic, it's not the ball blowing one, it's really good in the amazing. That's my understanding of it. Anything yeah. more technical for me to. <laughs> 
it's a, big, it's a beginner's session. Uh, not, not advanced electronics. <laughs> they usually they usually come with all the electric sound. Yeah. Yeah.
just the other day, it's probably worth trying uh, one of these. Uh, the Paul Bayou's um, obviously out there uh, in the blue back of there. So the web night, 21 black night pool. Um, yeah, it's a similar sort of thing that you'd use in like a scenario of uh, the, the, the reptiles. Um, <coughs> I've used that in the garden and out in the, in the field as well. Uh, Woodland is on the coast, we've got hundreds and hundreds of moths and moths uh, out there in the So, yeah, they're very effective. Right, okay. well, and then we have the leg boxes up here in some of the photos. Um, we get quite often in the we'll buy lots of leg boxes on the trays, and that's why. When you've got a trap, don't leave it empty, get some boxes. Or trains for top, whatever you want. Put them in the box, and the basically, uh, and put them in the trap, and basically just gives the moss somewhere. So it's settled down and squeeze into the holes, go to the tail, and uh, then you end up with a box for the moss. Uh, also got a gel underpins on there, and pop them in the silver wire on the far side. And you can have another, because it's not sitting there, and you can have 25, 30, 35 moss on each of the trains, on the air, and everything. So always having to have uh, to the bottom. Right, so we've got a few other methods which we're just going to have a, a, a look at. So, um, sugaring, so if you're not familiar with that, it's basically where you mix up um, a very sweet, sticky substance, so you can use overripe bananas, or any sort of overripe fruit, um, you've got red wine, anything like that, anything that's going to get to get uh, molasses, things like that. Chuck it all in a pan, heat it up, get it nice and thick, let it cool down, and basically paint it. And span all things onto the tree, something like that, uh, and you get a certain species of moth that will come into that. Um, yeah, really, it tends to work better uh, later in the summer, as I was saying earlier, because a lot of species will go to overripe, like wisdom of the fruit, so you can't do anything now. Uh, but it doesn't get loaded, but you may get some things a little bit different uh, from into that. This is a bit different method. You could obviously go out sweet netting, you could do that during the daytime, because a lot of moths are going to be roosting somewhere, a lot will be. Grass under that, so you can go out and uh, net in for the girls and combine them. You always have this to do with any main, and you can do that, you put anything in the sort of thing. But if we're there, any main work, the main work is always to put some of the castors of uh, the uh, moth as well. Um, another real good way of cooking uh, for moths is using pheromone rules. So basically, these are, you can see in here, the sort of pink uh, thing there. On this little like, rubber vial that's been impregnated with the pheromone of the female of the particular moth. So the clearing moth, um, and, and you do know what they have the in moths, and a few other species, um, the day flyers are very difficult to see. You wouldn't think anywhere around until you go to the other way. And if you're right on the end of the right location, you'll bring the males in. So only the males, as long as they think, boom, from the female. Uh, and they'll come in. Hang around a bit, and then realise the big cotton and then you know, disappear off. But it does give you the opportunity to pick them up. So, uh, Luna Hornet, that's, uh, when I went ahead and used that for the years, and I think that was the first time I tried them for garden at home. I think they like willows, and they really have the level of big kind of standard willow trees up off in the garden. So, probably out 10 minutes later, I had a Luna really Hornet moth this one, I've never seen one before. Wild red belt appearing, and that's, that's a word. So, you get them there again. Never seen them come to the mountain side of the time, never seen them come and go out and you can get them. Um, what I think is probably the most stunning moth in the UK, top one, the end of the moth, the male one, absolutely fantastic. Um, that began with the work last year, so the 10th part, so I put a go out for the first time and had two males come in within a few minutes. And they do look, I was, I was told, they look like small tortoise shells, as I'm flying. Uh, and I just saw I thought, oh, there's two small water on that. And they were pushing over and they made a beeline for the uh, world and hung around for quite a while. Never seen them before. And it's just incredible how these are out there and you don't see them. Uh, six belts of clearing, uh, they, I think you mentioned earlier, they, um, the log fruit plants is. That's what Trefoil. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and I put a log out there. Well, there's what you call a sweet net that's within also what's never found them off, put out, and I'm in within a minute, I have a place to them off. And it's just incredible where they've been. And then Tom says, 
Encouraged to smoke now. Yeah, so it's not even, it's smoking. <laughs> yeah, but, so it can happen, but obviously that's, you know, the chances are those in. And just a look at cast pillars in another way. Um, some of the cast pillars are very really obvious, such as these, uh, being so I'm moving on to uh, uh, the, the whole part of this. These are all some of the cast pillars, which can be easily found. Uh, they can talk about these on. Very stable, I think. Very stable, I think. Find what I can tend to find walking across the room. So they're looking for somewhere to keep any, so you can find and pick them up. And line hall off. Um, the only thing I've ever found then is one of the empty bird boxes at the end of the year, and you find um, the, 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 the Christmas in the bottom of the river where the poop is. So they spend in the winter there, so always very carefully remove them and run with some of the next. Put it in with a container and save it to the following May, waiting to emerge and sit in the room. So the light and warm water emerge is spectacular. So they can be found anyway, so it's just another way of finding these. Now we look at uh, a few other species you might come across. So the hot moss is always the one that people want to see. It's a big, 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 big interface moss, as you can see them in, I guess. I said the ethical moss is really good looking. Yeah, it comes in close, isn't it? And also the small open door moth. And these are fairly easy to find, the open door moth in particular. Uh, I think that one was right in my garden. Uh, that was my garden table. So you can that's just a suburban model for open door moth. So nothing fancy, but you, know, you can attract anything to show you what's out there. And on the next one, we've got some of the popular and pine hall moth. Pine hall moth do really well with the tent moth.
a beautiful little moth. Um, and yeah, it's just everywhere now. Um, have you caught them? Yes. You have caught them now. Yeah, yeah uh, it so is. Um, yeah, on the top there. That's another one. That was first put in 2017, I believe. Um, it was originally known from just one area in Kent. Um, and then, again, kind of changed natural thread. Um, it's, it's just worked its way up from the south. Um, I've only caught that one. That was in that last year. Um, <coughs> been a few records across knots and these swiggins have been much much more uh, uh, common and um, I think that's just taken quite a few records now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one to look out for. Uh, uh, as is the juice carpet, tiny little geometric moth. Um, so um, I've only got a couple of these, I think it's probably about the same sort of time, 2016, 2017, which recording in the county. Um, and um, yeah, again, coming from the southeast, spreading it around, um, I've tracked them north and got loads of these. Um, so they're, they're generally uh, a sort of southern coastal species. But yeah, they're, they're, they're working away in my now, and a lot of the other uh, the new arrivals. It's interesting to see. Uh, and this is one that, that's colonised, uh, it's fairly frequent now. It's more than less. It was, um, it was declared as extinct in the early 1900s, um, but it at the end of the century, it's a major resurgence, uh, colonised the country again. <coughs> um, it was fairly, fairly rare in Knox, but um, as the as the sort of 2000s went on, it's become more frequent now. A lot of people have uh, cultivated in wild lettuces, um, so brown field sites, prefer the early urban sites, um, you might find wild lettuce. Um, and, um, yeah, and that's some good to know. <coughs> and lots of microbes. So, um, yeah, uh, microbes have historically not been very uh, well recorded. People prefer to, to uh, record the bigger macromoths. Uh, this is probably due to the fact that there's so many of them, a lot of them look the same, they're very small, a lot of them are. Brown, brown, and yeah, people just generally didn't give them the time of day. Um, but uh, yeah, with the release of the Micro Moth Guide that came out in 2012, um, it's been, they've been uh, recorded with much more uh, frequency. Um, there's a general increase in moth recording, especially since the um, pandemic. <coughs> uh, so yeah, it's led to a great interest in microbes and also it's helped by. Social media and internet is just a lot more available for people to track in now uh, to be able to identify these ones in a bit more um, confidence. Um, what, one thing that people um, sort of ask is what's the difference between macro and micro moths? Uh, there's a big difference there with the pictures, there's massive privet hawk up there, <laughs> and then below a tiny, tiny horse chest that we my finger. Um, <coughs> so, yeah. Uh, but it's not necessarily the size um, that, that differentiates them because there are macro moths that are smaller than micro moths, confusingly. It's all about the taxonomy. Um, so, where species look, there might be a large species in, lumped in with a load of tiny species that are of the same family. But that said, yeah, there's a lot of very, very small ones. That's a few things. Uh, the um, you know, um, and it's just. Um, to demonstrate that, that difference. Uh, it's not necessarily size. These ones on the left hand side, green boy, green pea, uh, short plates and green strings and hearts out for all tiny little uh, macro moths. And then you've got the huge, huge side, the, uh, the micro moths that are bigger than all of them. Um, and now you've got a hard uh, box street moth and uh, a small magpie. So, so like that nicely. Um, uh, I said, yeah, people, people don't people tend to record them because they're brown and hard to identify. Just a few examples of you know, some of the, the browner end of spectrum. But um, yeah, I mean, with, with experience, it's a uh, it, it bit different. Shape and, uh, it's important to, to get these records because some of these moths are um, scarce and it's important to get more knowledge of them. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, then uh, you know, you've got the brown, the brown dogs, but then there's a huge var var variety of these, these little moths, uh, and some of them are really beautiful, especially if you get you know, a real close view to them. Um, so I'll just show you a few pictures here. So there's a spoiler at the top there, the black and white one, also known as a Brooks Bloody Moth. Funny shape that's got on the, on the black smudge of view from the book. Um, one of my favourites here, Pro Alpha Gasana, uh, at the top there. Um, just amazing that the jewel of the moth is, it looks like they're, like they're alive or something. Um, they're fairly, fairly scarce, so it's, it's nice, nice to see them. Uh, cherry Bark Thought Trips at the bottom left there, which is a beautiful metallic patterned uh, little Thought Tricks and Pamate or Tech, which is super more feeding. Just a few more examples um, there. Um, yeah, it's more like I've seen before. <coughs> what is great about tracking sort of you know, micro bots and things that haven't been recorded as, as frequently is that there's potential for even beginners to not have to increase the knowledge about the shapes and distribution of these bots. Um, a couple of examples I've tracked in the garden. Pollock, um, it's you know, fairly on the strip, it's a large garden, it's a big tree, but you know, it's, it's in suburban Nottingham, nothing magically special, but it's, I've still caught lots of the, the looking at the, the, the status of them in, in the county, yeah. you know, they're only known from a number of sites, and the junior forever I've never even heard of the one on the left, um, you know, a complete surprise to me, it was only a few records. Um, recent records of knots, and the one on the right is Dictionary of Minotana, and I believe that there's only one site um, <coughs> near Attenborough where it's, where it's been tracked before, and they now have put another dot on the map. Um, and, 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 and more people are recording, then, then those dots might, might increase. Um, and as I said before about the arrivals, it's, it's, it's the case with um, micro knots as well. There's, there's all sorts of frequent um, and, uh, and then you know, there's also uh, micro moths that you look out for uh, in Norton. In particular with micro and macro moths you get to get some nice rare rare migrants so it's some of the burden people people trap later in the season to try and get some of these rare moths and uh, you know, the white one there is called bicycle challenge which is a coastal Mainly coastal migrant, uh, caught a couple of years ago in public, and I'm pretty happy with that one. Uh, and uh, yeah, spreading through climate change again, there's, there's introduced species, uh, fox tree moth in particular, becoming a big problem. It's a pest of uh, garden native buxus, um, problem in garden centres, private gardens, a few issues on the continent. Really exploded in knots in the last last couple of months. I'd say last last year was the first year I caught them in, in regularly in various locations in the garden. I was getting them 30 plus months uh, in September, so yeah, they're going to be over <laughs> <coughs> uh, And I've just got a little bit of about leaf mines. And I can grab a lot about this <laughs> all day. Uh, <laughs> becomes very addictive, but it's a really easy way of uh, recording. Some moth species that, as adults, either you don't see because they don't come to light, or that they are very, very difficult to identify uh, in animal form. But they, uh, most species are specific to a particular plant, usually trees. Um, and once you identify the tree, you can identify the species due to the pattern that they make. So you get gallery lines uh, with these next to the moths. Um, Gallery miner, which you'll see everywhere if you do start looking at apple leaf miner, which doesn't just mine apple, <coughs> mines all sorts, so you'll see it everywhere. And then there's blotch miners as well, and then on the right to see these. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not really a beginner's thing, I guess, it's a bit niche, but it's really easy to just walk out the door and just have a look for these and you'll find them everywhere. Uh, and yeah, just just a few of the sites that we trap at. Uh, so my, my sort of said that we, we go out with this uh, lighting sheet set up 
Uh, we've got various groups, various friends of groups, uh, organisations, and, and track for them. We do it at our own sites, and tracks at centre parks. Um, and it's a just a great way of getting um, records uh, just for the general county, but also for all these specific places. Gives them a bit of data on what, what sort of mocks are on using the site. Yeah, we've been given a few dates already, haven't we, from today? So, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> gonna be busy, but busy here. Yeah. yeah. And we would just say as well, which we didn't put on here, but um, if you do, it's like anything else, if you do the re recording thing, send it to your county recorder. So there is, the macro county recorder is uh, Sheila Wright, uh, and the micro recorder, Martin Gray, Martin Gray who's actually in Lincolnshire, isn't he, I think? Was yeah. he on the border? Uh, but he's in Nottinghamshire, so they are split, but uh, you can find that information out anyway, and there's places to ask. If you are interested, so you've got them, Facebook, Pages. There's a garden moss scheme to get involved in as well, to do at home. Um, and I think the thing as well, that we say, you know, you never know where you might turn up. So myself and Tom were lucky enough to um, catch this moth um, coming up to five years ago, which is crazy. I didn't realise it was that long ago. So one night in Netherfield Lagoons, um, we picked up a light knot grass. Not, so there's a, the knot grass moth, which is fairly common. And we got this light knot grass, which we knew was different and kind of make sure we got a photo of it and thought, yeah, that's nice. And then the next day, um, there were reports from Derbyshire and Leicestershire, I think, was it yeah. Lincolnshire somewhere? And it turns out, and we hadn't appreciated this at the time, that it's, um, it's, uh, it's a migratory species, but literally from, like, the moorlands, I think Staffordshire, there. And they do have these occurrences where they'll just move out into the wider countryside, basically, and further afield. And so this moth, in particular, was the first one... Well, it's probably the, it's the first adult moth on record in no, Nottinghamshire. Sure. Yeah. And the only previous record was a larvae from Edward so back in the late 19th century. So, so actually, you know, we didn't go to target that. We just went out moth trapping, and it coincided with this this spread of these moths. That, and then there were a few other records from Knox, I think, over the next few nights, yeah, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah. Uh, last year there was a spread of Rannoch Looper was another moth that did the same thing last year. Yeah, it's normally yeah. a Scottish species. And that was popping up all over the place. So, yeah, you never know. You never know where you might find. Oh, yeah, thank you. So, any questions? <laughs>